Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Week Ahead. I'm Tony Nash. Today, we're doing a special geopolitical show, uh, and we're joined by Albert Marco, Virginia Tucky, and Ralph Schulhammer. Guys, thanks so much for taking the time to join us for this. I'm really excited about this episode. Um, we're talking uh, first about Russia's growing relationships. Um, there's a lot going on with Russia kind of at the center. So we're going to talk through a little bit of that. Uh, Albert's going to lead on that. We've got some upcoming elections. Um, and so we'll talk about European elections. We'll talk about U.S. elections uh, with Ralph and with Albert um, and Virginia. And then finally, we'll talk about Latin America's battle of ideas. We've, we, you know, we've had a libertarian uh, elected in Argentina. And we'll talk about the impact across the region uh, and, and across the world. So, uh, hey, I'd like to make sure you know that you can access our AI-driven market forecasting tool called CI Markets for free. No strings attached, and it does not require any credit card information. Go to completeintel.com slash markets to subscribe. CI Markets is the perfect addition to your analysis toolbox. This free account includes Nikkei stocks, major currency pairs, and global economics. Of course, we offer much more in our paid account, but this lets you experience CI Markets before making a financial commitment. CI Markets uses the power of AI to help you make better trading and investment decisions. It's absolutely free. Again, go to completeintel.com slash markets to subscribe to CI Markets free. Uh, guys, again, thanks so much for joining us today. This is this is really excellent. Um, Albert, let's start with you with Russia. Um, we saw uh, Vladimir Putin visiting uh, the UA UAE and Saudi Arabia this week. Uh, then we saw Iran's President Raisi visit Moscow. Um, so the tweet that I'm showing right now is a snapshot of the Saudi Crown Prince um, correcting Putin's translator, supposedly, uh, over a statement around the uh, Soviet recognition of Saudi independence. And MBS said that Saudi Arabia was reunified instead of newly independent at the time. This is kind of post-World War One, But you know, it was really interesting to me that he jumped in and corrected so quickly and Putin just kind of accepted it. I mean, to me, it tells me that Putin's doing a tour to kind of raise some money or do something. Um, I could be very wrong here. Um, but there's a lot going on uh, with Russia, obviously, especially with Ukraine. But can you tell me, what, like, what's your read on this kind of hurried diplomacy that Russia is doing right now? What does that really mean? It's really mainly about uh, oil prices and the stability in the oil market right now. I mean, Russia doesn't really have a functioning economy except for selling commodities and energy. And that's just the reality of it. So they need to formulate, you know, ties to the Middle East, specifically OPEC, and hopefully to stabilize the oil market so they can benefit out of it. I know that there's like a cap on Russian Russian oil prices, but I mean, realistically, it's going, everything's going to India and China and then back to Europe to get resold onto the market. So for him, I think it's more of an asymmetrical challenge against uh, the economic sanctions to uh, help Moscow out in the long run. Okay. Um, is there, you know, R Russia has been accepting other currencies, rupees and CNY and other currencies for their crude. Uh, could part of this be him trying to kind of offload some of that stuff to these other markets? Could, you know, you know, I, I, maybe, and I'm not, I, I don't want to even make, I don't want to even have like a real discussion on that. Cause we just don't know. I know that the rupee, right. the rupee and the ruble trade was a debacle. They, they got stuck with rubies that they can't use. Uh, right. The one, you know, ruble trade, it's, you know, it is what it is. It's more of a barter system. Right. But the reality is, is they're still, you know, most of their companies enact in dollars. They're not cut off from SWIFT, you know, so it's not really I, I don't really like the, the narrative that, you know, they're trying to move away from the dollar and onto another currency. When the fact of the matter is all of the 99 percent of the oil contracts globally is settled in dollars anyways. OK, uh, so, you know, I, I hear the other side of that and people say that this Chinese, this CIPS system is is really kind of circumventing SWIFT and, um, and you know, supposedly there's this huge trade in CNY or other currencies that's circumventing SWIFT and circumventing the dollar. How realistic is that? And is there a way to know? 
are there any numbers out there? Is there a way to infer that? I mean, I know we have a lot of anti-dollar kind of cheerleaders out there, but is there really a way to understand what's happening on that uh, Chinese system? Not really, because it's just a barter system between two nations. So you can't really, you can't really sit there and make a judgment saying they're going to replace the dollar with this different SWIFT system that they currently have, because they're just there's no way to assess it in reality. So it's, it's a barter system between two nations. The moment you start adding nations on to these sort of things, that's when the failures start happening and the problems become. Evident, evidently clear, and they have no solution for that. So, of course, they resort back to using the SWIFT. Right. Mm. Right. Um, yeah, and and I think uh, part of it with China at the center of this, you know, part of that, it, the problem is that the CNY really isn't a currency. It's more of a coupon because it's not, it's not convertible. Um, and so the CNY is worth what the PBOC says it's worth. It's not worth what other countries say. So there have come disputes over that. I'm not sure how well understood that is by a lot of these people. So can you tell me in general, um, Albert, uh, and you know, Ralph, jump in here, but is Russia's influence growing? So we see a lot of these trips and people visiting Russia and you know, Russia, China visits, that sort of thing. Is Russia's influence growing? I'll make it really quick so uh, Ralph can jump in here, but um, yes and no, right? Okay. It's it, it's it's growing in terms of commodities trade because of inflation and all these other, you know, bad policies out of Europe and the United States, you know, uh, compounding the problem. But geopolitically, I, I, not really. I mean, they don't really have a functioning military that can attack, you know, NATO like everyone threatens. You know, they 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 could take Ukraine. So what, what power projection do they possibly, could they possibly have? What kind of influence can they have a world away at this point in time? None, to my understanding. What do you think, Ralph? No, I agree. I think there's just two quick things I would I would add. And uh, as we know, Putin and the Russians, I think symbolism matters for them. So that Putin makes one of his rare in-person visits abroad and comes to the United Arab Emirates at a time when due to COP28, many other Western leaders are there as well, I think is both a signal from Russia, but I think also from the from the Gulf states that they are not fully on board with Western politics vis-a-vis -vis Russia. They try to pursue their own strategy. I think Albert kind of hit the nail on the head. This is why OPEC Plus is also willing to talk about uh, future oil prices. There is maybe something, Tony, that you can also talk a little bit about. I think there's a little bit of a disagreement. I think that the Saudis would be more open to higher oil prices compared to the Russians because the Russians, I feel, always fear that high oil prices uh, will lead to more investment in U.S. shale. And I think Moscow fears nothing more than, than the U.S. shale industry. And as a last point, going to what Albert just said, it's, I think, both of it, right? It's, it's One can say that the influence is growing, but on the other hand, I never, and I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this, I never really fully bought into the dragon bear kind of idea. I think this is a very Western uh, idea to look at this, this idea, right, that there really are friends in international relations like the U.S. and Canada or U.S. and Europe. This is not how the Chinese and the Russians view each other. So the Chinese don't look at the Russians and the Russians at the Chinese as, I don't know, um, you know, the British and the Americans look at each other. So I think the Russians don't want to be uber dependent on China. And they also, of course, have an eye on the Chinese economy, because if the Chinese are their main or would become their main partner, if China would spiral into a crisis, they would take the Russians down with them. So I think there is a, the Russians want to diversify as well. That's, I think, something they can do. I agree with, with Albert, they cannot do great power projection around the globe. But there is this idea that happened before the invasion of Ukraine, Putin said that in a speech, right, that the Russians want to be friends with everybody and enemies with no one. I mean, we know how the latter one worked out, but I think the, the first part is not entirely wrong. So, and there is always this idea that was usually always said about the Chinese, right? When the West uh, goes somewhere, they give a lecture. When the Chinese come, they bring an airport. And I think this is at least partially true with the Russians as well. So uh, there is, I think there is, it's, it is tricky, but I agree with Peter with Albert. The problem is not that the Russians are super strong or that the, the Russians are playing 3D chess or something that you, Tony, like to say about the Chinese, right? That they think are, are ahead in generations. But like in a real game of chess, you don't have to be a grandmaster. You just have to be better than your opponent. Uh, and I think we have a problem in this kind of geopolitical thinking in the West at the moment. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's just it's just, you know, people 
a good friend of mine, very well known, the Dragon Baron, this <laughs> Houston word. You know, I love her to death. And you know, on some points, she's absolutely correct on the Dragon Bear thing, but on other points, where this like integrated, unified, uh, two capital system trying to overtake the rest of the world is just, you know, I, I have really, real big trouble buying that. You know, knowing knowing well how the Chinese view the Russians and how the Russians view the Chinese, like Ralph was saying, is just, you know, they don't trust each other. They don't like each other. Culturally, they're different. Uh, economically, they're different. Uh, they don't really complement each other, except for in times of, you know, extreme geopolitical or economic strain that they can barter a little bit here and there. But, you know, I, I don't really I don't really uh, look at, a, you know, a China moscow axis as a, a real competitor to the united states and the, and the anglosphere in my opinion yeah so here's the reality they don't trust each other for a second okay the chinese and the russians are antagonistic so they are in a partnership by necessity they are not in a partnership by choice there has never been an instance where china and russia have aligned where the russians haven't won OK, so the Chinese want to believe that they have the upper hand in this relationship and the rest of the world wants to believe that China has the upper hand in this relationship. But there has never been an instance historically where China has um, prevailed over Russia. So, you know, are the Russians super smart? You know, whatever. I, I don't know. But if we look at the um, the trade for Outer Mongolia, the Russians won when the Chinese were weak, right? If we look at the late 50s, early 60s, when the Soviets and the CCP were trying to cooperate, the Soviets won. And China suffered big time with famine, with upheaval, with ultimately the Cultural Revolution, all this other stuff. So, and there has, there's never been a time where the Chinese have prevailed over the Russians. So... I, this whole dragon bear thing, I mean, again, I love the author of that as well. It's great. <laughs> it's super smart and, you know, all that stuff. But it is not a partnership by choice. It is a partnership by necessity. I'll, yeah. You know, I'll tell you, Tony, before Ralph chimes in here. Um, there was one comment, one phrase that Putin had said that every single geopolitical person misinterpreted or even just missed, where Putin said, we have nuclear assets in the Pacific, right? And I, I forgot the exact wording, but that's what generally he was saying that. However, most thought that that was a threat against NATO and the Ukraine and so on and so forth. That was a threat against the Chinese not to, not to get adventurous on the border while Russia had moved his troops to support the Ukraine invasion, right? Well, that's what that was. Do you remember this thing that happened, I think, two years ago? There was a North Korean video that came out where they intentionally showed targeting North Korean missiles toward China. Do you remember that? Oh, so, yeah. I mean, it was <laughs> subtle, but there was a little bit made about it when it was put out. So, you know, th there is this kind of de facto or this go to that, you know, China, they're the masters and commanders and they're in charge of everyone. And it's just not the case. And if you kind of peel back that perception, you know, they're they're not always in charge. Ralph, go ahead. I'm going to go out a little bit on a limb here, uh, but it's, it's a little bit provocative, so I hope I won't be misunderstood. So Please the argument I'm making, so, so the, the argument I'm making is really a political one, not a moral one. So I see the world differently morally than I see it politically. But exactly what Albert and you just mentioned, um, there is an opening, of course, right? This is this. I think you you could because the ties between Russia and China are not as close as one would think. I think you could break Russia out uh, of this quote unquote. A partnership of necessity uh, with the right, you know, with the right policies, the right diplomatic uh, initiatives. Uh, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, I think actually for the first time I pronounced his name correctly, right? His idea that he will go to Russia and do the same, that he do the reverse Nixon and, and you know, kind of do what what uh, Nixon did with China, with Russia. I think that's, uh, that's a little bit out there. But in, again, and I'm not a fan of him, uh, but in principle, right, this idea, and we had these choices to make in World War II as well, right, that you cannot be opposing everyone, you cannot be simultaneously opposing Iran, and you cannot be simultaneously opposing Russia and China, and, and trying to kind of, you know, force 
if you want your worldview or, the, or, or an ideal world against their will. That, that's not going to happen. As Albert, I think, correctly points out, we are not in a multipolar world, uh, but even in a unipolar world doesn't mean that you can do everything everywhere all at once and i think that is something we have to realize and as we saw of course over the last two years russia doesn't have much but given the role they play in the energy sector i mean they're still the, the second largest exporter of oil right i mean that gives them some leverage and i think on the long run some way must be found to either make russia similar to other countries a standalone force if you want uh, but one that that's at least positively inclined towards the west or kind of bring them even closer back onto the fold. Now, I know this sounds absurd now, but if we want to do a deep dive into Russian history, I mean, a lot of this has always been driven by a Russian minority complex, right? They always, I mean, this goes back to Catherine the Great. They always wanted to be European, but never were fully accepted as European. Yeah. So I think emotionally, they tend much more towards the West than they, than they tend towards the Chinese. And this brings us, and I think Albert can say more about this, in a sense, the war in Ukraine, right, I think it was completely correct to prevent at all costs that they will annex the entirety of Ukraine, right? To make sure, I think it was more due to the, the, the flaws in the Russian army and I think that the strength of the European army that they prevented the capture of, of Kiev, but they prevented it. I think there is a very, very good chance, a very high likelihood that Ukraine will prevail as an independent state. And I think that was a primary goal of the West. Now, is it worth now to go into a prolonged Cold War with the Russians and the Chinese as quote unquote these partners of necessity over Crimea and a couple of, of provinces in eastern Ukraine. I mean, as I said, this is a, a political question. Morally, one can say yes, absolutely. And I'm not unsympathetic to this. But I think in international relations, we don't just deal with moral questions. We also deal with realities on the ground. And as we will talk about when we move into future elections in Europe, the population is shifting, right? The, the, the winds are shifting. So the question is, how much are we willing to risk over, quote unquote, you know, Crimea and, and these these provinces in these? Again, yeah. I know this is sounds very cold, very calculated, but no. this is what international politics has always been. That's right. Yeah. And that's that's one of the things I was discussing with somebody in DMs, actually, in Insta and uh, Twitter, uh, you know, you know, support Ukraine and so on and so forth. I'm like, you know, take the morality completely out of it. Right. Because domestic politics and domestic interests in a nation that's going through elections are going to supersede anything geopolitically that you're talking about in like 12 months to 24 months out. There's no question about that, right? And right now, the appetite for sending $100 billion to Ukraine is gone in reality. I mean, you can't, tell, um, you can't tell a mechanic that's got a family to run, does a feed in Ohio that Forget about your small business and medium-sized business loans and so and problems. We have to send sixty billion dollars over to Ukraine. That's not going to work. Right. That's right. not going to work it in Europe right now. It's anymore. not going to work anywhere in the world at the moment. Yeah. And that's yeah. just the reality. Virginia, I want to get your thoughts on this. Let me let me offer something first in response to what uh, Ralph said. But I want to get your thoughts on on Russia, China. Um, so, Ralph, what you bring up is a very interesting uh, proposition about kind of rebuilding relationships with, say, Russia and China. And I think from a, um, a practitioner's point of view, you have to think, how would that happen? You just show up in Moscow and things magically repair. No, you have to think about things like, OK, we have, say, let's say the US. The US has to go through Korea to build relationships with Russia. The U.S. has to go through India to build relationships with Russia. Those are very strong relationships. Those are the first things that have to happen to set the stage so the terms can come out to build a successful relationship, right? Because they can't go through the U.K. because the U.K. and Russia have been at odds for a long time. Uh, going through Germany, very suspect, <laughs> especially with Russia. You know, you really don't know which side the Germans are playing and so on, right? So, you know, you have to go through some of the Asian allies. Um, and of course, India, you re really never really know if they're playing the Russian side or the U.S. side. But I think India realizes the U.S. is more important than they have ever before. And so I think India can be uh, kind of an unbiased broker. And Korea, obviously, which politically is uh, very aligned with the U.S., has a very good relationship with Russia. And the U.S. can go, you know, work with Korea to build to, again, I'm talking about setting the foundation and the stage for a new relationship with Russia. China is a different story. And, you know, a lot of that just has to happen directly. Virginia, I'm curious your perspective on Russia and Russia-China from Latin America 
Well, what yeah, I know that especially the Chinese have come in with a lot of development money and a lot of loans and funding and that sort of thing. And Russia, obviously, a tight relationship with Brazil and Venezuela and other places. Do you think for first question, do you think Russia's influence in Latin America is growing? Yes, they okay. are influencing. Yeah, because they have like this partnership, as you said, of necessity with China. And they are, they are operating in Latin America from Cuba, Venezuela, Guatemala, also Argentina is like, they are fighting for Argentina. They really want Argentina. There is also a problem. They are trying to re-emerge re there. There is the Falkland, Malvina Islands um, problem and situation we have the, with the UK. I mean, Argentina with the UK and Maybe you saw it that the European Union said, okay, we are going to call it now Malvinas, not Falkland anymore. Mm. And there was a provoca provocation to the UK. And that was just after the president, and now that is going away from Argentina, the living president, he's, he was with Xi Jinping, and they were talking about the island. Why? Because China, they have a base here, a military base in the south of Argentina. And the island being British is a problem for them there, you know, for a strategy problem because of the seas. And if something happens there, they are messing with the UK. So China and Russia, yes, I agree. They don't like each other, but I think they concluded that they are in an exact moment when America is declining in some way. Uh, with, I mean, Biden and all the politicians, we see a lot of corruption around and they have interest with these people, Russians and Chinese, we can see that. So they're taking advantage of the situation and they are creating like different issues around the world. They are in Latin America, they are in uh, Africa, you know, in Africa, they're, the, the Russians, they are doing whatever they want there. And they are very well connected with Iran, that Iran is giving all these weapons and money to Hamas and the Hezbollah that they are making this war with Israel. So if you see around the world, this axis of evil, Iran, China, and Russia, they are messing around the world. We have a war in Europe, in the Middle East. And now we have this situation here in Venezuela, that you see, it looks like it's small, a small thing, but it's not because Latin America is like, you know, it's not really in peace as it looks. You have a lot of mm. guerrillas and going on and they are acting like in Chile, Chile, in Argentina, not like in big time, like in the seventies. And these people are all connected. So yes, yeah. they are acting in Latin America as they are acting around the world. Uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous if countries, people, and leaders don't realize uh, what is going on. Because what could happen, what I see is that we could have here uh, Ukraine in Latin America. And I see this happening here in South America. Okay. A uh, couple of things I want to roll mm -hmm. back to. You talk about a Chinese military base in Argentina. I don't think many people know about that. So can you give us a, some details on that? Well, it's in the south of Argentina. If you go on the on the way, you can see it from a distance, but no one can get into there. If you're a journalist, whatever, no one knows what's going on there. And so we know there's something. They say there is for cooperation for the weather to check the weather. We oh no, mm. wait, that's not true. Um, but they are there. And they have a lot of interest in Argentina and because of the position of Argentina in the map around the, for the seas. And well, in the South America, we have a lot of limits, Brazil, uh, Chile, that limit with Chile could be complicated in the future um, and the resources. Argentina is under uh, never seen before poverty level we saw that this kind of inflation before, but no, this poverty level, we never seen this decline in culture, education. Argentina was never like this. And uh, 
they are taking advantage of this. And we have a lot of resources here. I mean, agricultural, cattle, and the soil in Argentina is very good. And we don't have much people in Argentina. It's 44 million. It's the biggest eighth country in the world. So can you imagine 1 million people fly, fly away from Argentina already? They emigrated because of the situation. So this is a point where they can do whatever they want. A large country, no control, rich country with a lot of things to do here. And so, uh, and yes, they have corruption and corruption. This, when you see how Ukraine was, I mean, before the war, how it was very, a very corrupted country, you can compare that with Argentina and their politicians, how they manage it here. So it's very easy. It's very easy mm -hmm. for a Chinese to come and bribe a politician, even important thing, if people from companies or representatives, even in the agricultural side that you see there that is very genuine and strong people that they fight against, you know, high taxes. And you can now find there are a lot of influence there that we never saw before. So yes, we have, you know, they are inter very interested in uh, the resources of Argentina, but also in the position Argentina occupies in South America and how they can expand everything here. And they are in Cuba now. You saw that they have a military base now in Cuba to spy Americans that whatever all around. So they are not stopping. They are taking all around the world and they are surrounded America. Yep. So I think um, it sounds like what you all are all saying is that Russia, Russia has been... I think, pragmatic opportunists for a long time. Uh, China has become, you know, they, they had this wolf warrior diplomacy couple of years. They realized about a year ago that that was an utter failure. And so they've become pragmatic opportunists again, uh, which is great. Um, whereas the, the U.S. from a diplomatic perspective seems to be very ideologically driven and not very pragmatically driven. Is that is oh. that all fair to say? Yeah, I mean the 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 big the bigger issue is the lack of actual policies that the U.S. and Europe have made geopolitically in areas that you know they should be focused. Latin America, for one, it's just been. I mean, the U.S. foreign policy in Latin greater. America, well, it's it's just idiotic. So, like, yeah. wh why have what have, we haven't done anything constructive in Latin America in I don't even know how long, fifty years, forty years? I have no idea. I can't even tell you. Right. And then like the going back to that Argentinian Chinese base, that's, you know, from what I understood is a listening station and also a missile targeting station. I mean, we have no the U.S. is uh, Achilles heel is actually the southern border when it comes to uh, ICBM. So and that's quite well known in the DOD. So it's problematic to hear that the Chinese have been not only going into Argentina and Cuba, but also trying to buy up former NATO bases in the Atlantic Ocean you know, from yep. Spain and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's something that the United States needs to really address and not just continually overlook. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll do it at the last minute. The U.S. will do it at the last minute when they absolutely have to and spend 100 times more than they need to. Yeah, that's least. exactly right. Hey, I'd like to make sure you know that you can access our AI-driven market forecasting tool called CI Markets for free. No strings attached, and it does not require any credit card information. Go to completeintel.com slash markets to subscribe. CI Markets is the perfect addition to your analysis toolbox. This free account includes Nikkei stocks, major currency pairs, and global economics. Of course, we offer much more in our paid account, but this lets you experience CI Markets before making a financial commitment. CI Markets uses the power of AI to help you make better trading investment decisions. It's absolutely free. Again, go to completeintel.com slash markets to subscribe to CI Markets Free. So, okay, let's move on from this. This has been fascinating, guys. Let's move on to some upcoming elections. Um, Ralph, we've got some elections coming in uh, Europe. We've got EU elections, Austria, Germany, France, UK. Can you help us understand kind of what are the main issues Um and do you see voters moving into a more populist direction? So we saw in the Netherlands, um, Geert Wilders uh, came to power or, or was elected in the Netherlands. He still has to build a coalition and stuff. But um, this BBC uh, graphic I've got up says that um, his elections spooked Europe. So 
Are other European countries kind of spooked by Wilder's uh, election or do you think that they'll move more in that direction based on whatever some of those issues are? So first, can you address the kind of spooked question, the Wilder's question, but then can you walk us through so what some of the main issues are that European voters are looking at? Well, I'm pretty sure that the editorial board of The Economist has been spooked. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about the, the rest the rest of my the, former of the employer. Yeah. So sorry, I got out the I mean the, right. the, the, intelli the intelligence unit is a fantastic source of information. But let's say the, the opinion pages of The Economist has seen has seen has seen better days. Yeah. Um, no, there is a there is a it's it's a couple of things that's coming together. I mean, there have been these populist waves in Europe before, and usually they they kind of come up and then they they app again. But I think this time it is more sustainable for the, the very simple reason, uh, partially because of what happened in the Middle East over the last couple of, of weeks. Um, it has been quite clearly, I would argue, revealed that that both the, the Islamist and the migration problem is much, much more significant than has been admitted. This has been sugarcoated by European politicians and the European media in the past. Uh, this definitely had an impact on the elections in the Netherlands. It definitely had an impact on two regional elections in two Western uh, German states a couple of uh, also weeks ago, where the, the Alternative for Germany did quite well. I mean, these so-called populist right-wing or far right-wing or extremist, whatever you want to call it, parties, I mean, if you look at the numbers in the polls, I mean, it it's kind of depends on where you stand, right? I mean, the AfD in Germany is in second place. Uh, the right-wing Freedom Party in Austria is in first place. Wilders came in first place in the Netherlands. Uh, I mean, are they really the fringe? It, it, again, it really depends where, where you're standing. And I think two things that are still driving this is one is the migration issue. Uh, one is the inflation issue. And I think another one is a general distrust in the political class. I think the UK, that is also upcoming elections, is a great example there. People are tired of having, quote unquote, conservatives in office, but never having conservatives in power. So they're going to get shellacked in the next elections because people want right wing policies. And just as before with Russia and Europe, right? I'm not saying this necessarily because I personally endorse it. I have my own views on this, but this is the sense you get when you talk to Europeans. This is the sense what you get when you uh, when you listen to what voters are saying. It's in many ways, I would argue, it's not rocket science. They want less migration, particularly from, let's say, culturally um, distanced lands, right? This is very clear. Like nobody in France has a problem with migrants from Portugal. The problem starts if you have migrants from the Middle East and particularly, of course, with people with an Islamist background. That's a fact, right? We can have debates whether this is Islamophobia, racism or whatnot, but it's simple fact. This is how a majority of the people feels. We have polls about this that says that most Europeans want an entire stop to all migration. Uh, from Muslim countries. So when the whole brouhaha was a couple of years ago with uh, Trump's Muslim ban that wasn't really a Muslim ban, a majority of Europeans actually wants a Muslim ban. And that poll was done by, was done by, by Chatham House, the former Royal Institute of International Affairs. So not some you know right-wing nut job uh, um, institution. And I think as long as as you know, politicians of the quote unquote mainstream parties are not willing to react to this, uh, these populist parties will will continue to grow. And what is important is I think the the hesitancy is breaking away. Right? There was always a shy right wing voter, but I think the people are becoming increasingly less shy about it. So I think unless something significant happens over the next couple of months or, or the next two years, I think that the, the people voting for these right wing parties openly is going to increase. So I'm very, very strongly of the opinion, based on what we know now, that this will really be a right-wing wave. Uh, the next chancellor in Austria is going to be from the Freedom Party, as things currently look. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point the resistance of the conservatives in Germany breaks down and they actually will consider entering coalition governments on the local level and the federal level with the AFD. Um, and honestly, I'm not entirely sure that uh, President Le Pen in France is entirely impossible. They, they're going to vote a year later. Right? Because once these things get... This thing, Europe is not as unified as we would like to be, but we are unified enough that if something happens in one part and it doesn't cause the end of the world that was promised by the media and others, it spills over in other countries. So if he had willed us, I don't think he will manage to become prime minister. I think they're still going to prevent this. But you, if you have it in Austria, if you kind of have done an opening up towards the right in Germany, I think that the chance that then the people in France also say, OK, what's so bad about this, I think is very, very high. Again, there's still a lot of time out, but something is shifting. If yeah. hypothetically, and this goes back, Tony, to connect it with something you said before. Now, I would also not rule out 
that at some point Olaf Scholz in Germany picks up the phone, calls whoever is going to be in the White House when he calls them and says, how about we start talking to Moscow with, with your blessing? And how about if, if, if Germany is actually taking that role, is playing that role, kind of trying to play the mediator? Because if they can go into the 2025 elections with a, a peace deal brokered by Berlin, that would go down really well with the German populace, right? This is something that could potentially save uh, Schultz's ch chancellorship. And as Albert said before, um, when it comes to domestic policies, right, these international moral considerations go out of the window. So I would not be surprised. And the Germans, if we're entirely honest, they were never 100% wholeheartedly behind supporting Ukraine and going against Russia for, for, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Sorry. So I want to, uh, there's a lot. <laughs> Mike drop. That's right. There's a lot there. Off. One of the things I want to, definitions are really important. Okay. So you kept using the word right wing. Okay. Now, Elon Musk famously said, you know, I used to be left of center, but the Democrats pulled things so far left that now I'm viewed as right of center. And so these things that you're saying right wing, would these things say 10 years ago have been considered right wing? Well, okay. I think that that's a great question. So for listeners, viewers, it depends on, on what, what your primary defining issue for right wing is. For me, it is, and this goes back to also what you guys talked about Latin America. For me, the biggest dividing issue between the left and the right is that the right still has a sense of nationalism and patriotism, whatever you want to call it, and the left does not. I think that is the broadest thing. So Gerd Wilders is, for example, is a, is a, is a patriot or a nationalist, uh, but who is more a market libertarian. The, uh, the, the right wing in Germany and Austria is similar in their attitudes towards, towards you know, uh, their, their identity, towards nationalism, but they are more state interventionist in the economy. So, so in, 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 the, in the realm of the economy, there are vast differences. The same with Le Pen in France, right? She's not a market. She has changed her stance a little bit, but she's not a market libertarian. So, so there is a difference there. But they are definitely convinced that the primary objective of a government should be the pursuit of the national interest and not some kind of broader international morality. And that's to be clear, I don't mean this in a conspiratorial sense, in a WEF uh, or George Soros or whatever kind of sense. I think this is just the attitude in which a lot of our political leadership has been educated and marinated, right? This idea that yeah. the national interest is of yes yesterday and it's reactionary and the true obligation of the politician of, of the ruling class is to pursue this this vast international goals but i think more and more people realize and that's my last point that this becomes at some point an absurd stance and i mean take the issue of latin america i mean it strikes me as very absurd that first you support somebody like like uh, luis ignacio da silva in brazil who is openly anti-western and then you have to use your term tony then you have the entire western media spooked by Millet, who, whatever his flaws are, comes out and openly says he's pro-Western, he's pro-Western, he's pro-Western. So he literally throws himself at Washington, at Brussels. And the other reaction is, oh, but this is the far right, the right wing extremist madman. Right. And to be yeah. honest, so what if he's that? I mean, obviously right. he wants to be, quote unquote, he wants to play on our team. So I would take him. But it looks like that we simply can't do this. Yeah. And well, I also want to go ahead, Albert. They simply just don't want anyone on the right to succeed any in any which way politically or economically. I mean, the entire the entire argument about nation national interest superseding uh, global interest is just absolute logic. It's it's consensual logic here. I mean, who who is voting for these politicians at the end of the day? If you look at Germany, the deindustrialization of Germany is so awful right now, that there is no choice for most of these people to, but to vote for an opposite party, whoever is in charge. And it's going to be tested, and we're going to see what national interest versus globalization, uh, we'll see who's going to win that fight in, in the German elections coming up. Yeah, I think what we're seeing, both in the U.S. and in Europe, is um, parties, the prevailing view always goes too far in one direction or the other. And so we've had you know, um, I think 10, 15 years ago, Europe and the US were probably pretty okay with migration. Uh, but things have gone way too far. I, I don't, I don't personally believe any of this is based on a hatred of religion or racism or anything. I think these people are just, they just want to preserve who they are, whether they're Dutch or German or Austrian or whatever, right? Um, and so, uh, and, and with inflation, I think, 
the the energy policies particularly have been inflationary. And so these policies have just gone too far. So whether it's immigration, inflation, or other things, it just seems like this uh, political, these political guys who have been in power, whether they're right or left, they just happen to be left at this point in history, they just take their policies too far for your kind of average person to bear. Is that a fair thing to say? No, I think it's a very fair thing to say. And and there is, I know this, we, we discussed this in, in other uh, podcasts before, but for example, the, the, the energy debate and the climate debate, at least in Europe, has in many ways left the grounds of rationality. And let me say very clearly what I mean by this. Um, you have debates in Austria, like we're a country of 8 million people. Um, and it is pretended as if the climate policies of Austria have an impact on the global climate. So you don't have to be a climate change denier to know that that's absurd. But this is like, yeah. this again, this is seriously to be talked about. So this idea that we had this recently, that if you make a, a, you know, a stricter speed limit on Austrian highways, this is how you're going to save the, Aust- uh, the, 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 you know, the global climate. So this is these are absurd debates. And yeah. also to go back to what Albert said, I mean, the deindustrialization in Germany is a direct consequence of their energy policy, right, of this yeah. idea that the Germans will save the world. They will they will lead the world into the glorious renewable future. They have run the experiment. I mean, I, I jokingly said because the German foreign minister was in also at the COP28 and said the entire world is looking at us. Yes, they are. And what they see is not something that they want to emulate. I mean, this is again, right. nobody. Everybody is very polite, but pretty much everybody looks at the Germans and says, you guys have lost your mind. I mean, some are saying it openly, yeah. some saying it less openly. Some don't say it like the Chinese because for them it's big business, right? They sell solar panels, they mm-hmm. sell wind turbines and all these kind of things. But ultimately, this was a direct consequence. And going back just real quick to what you said, Albert, right? And people say, no, no, wait a moment. You basically lied to us in the realm of energy and the environment. You also lied to us in the area of immigration. So a growing number of people says, we want you out. I think that's, that's again, it's not, you're correct. It's not that they vote for racist potentially. And I don't, the AFD is a mixed bag, depending if you look at their, you know, Eastern wing or their Western wing. But it's not that they say we vote for them because we share everything they say. They say we vote for them because they're the only way for us to slap those in power, you know, metaphorically give them give them a, a slap yeah. right they want them out and this is of course on the long run i mean it's just as a quick thing um the so-called populist parties i would say are rather still are rather clumsy i don't find them particularly let's say charismatic in the leadership but can mm-hmm. you rule that out in the future can you rule out that a real populist comes along in germany in austria or usually the combination is you know you the populist starts in Austria and then moves to Germany, as we historically once had. Can you really rule this out on the long run? I'm not so sure about this. And then we're gonna wish it would only be the Gerd Wilders and the, you know and and, and 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 the Le Pen's when you have really really kind of then these yeah. these extreme uh, right wingers that say we don't just want to work within the system, we want to break the system. So I'd be you know be careful what one wishes for. Yeah. Now, Ralph, real quick before we before we move on to the U.S. with Albert, I want to talk about Ukraine because I have this uh, graphic up saying that EU countries only order only 60,000 shells for Ukraine by a new scheme. Just real quickly, is Europe becoming tired and weary of Ukraine? Yes. Um, and, and you see this in three ways. I mean, Slovakia had elections where Robert Fico is now poised to become prime minister, who is very, very, you know, he's really almost pro-Russian. Um, the, the more Ukraine critical parties in Europe are gaining in the polls. Um, and and the idea and this is again this 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 gap between the leadership if you want I, I dislike the term elites a little bit but I use it now nonetheless and the majority of the population the idea that Ukraine in the next five six years will become an EU member is complete insanity I mean they can do it but at some point the EU is going to break there is a growing sense right that, that this is again promises are being made to another country with barely any you know how what is the term without any um, consultation. Oversight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, consultation with their own populations, and then they are surprised that elections and 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 the way they do. This yeah. is in some way, and this is my last provocative statement. In some <laughs> way, I would argue that Kiev overplayed its hand. Absolutely, I think they they really they really believed that that the West or Europe is in it all the way. You know, for as long as it takes. But those were just politicians' platitudes. As Albert said before, once elections, basically, as long as it takes. It's just political speech for until the next election. And this is this is what we see now happening. So again, as I said, morally, 
I'm all I'm also all pro Ukraine, but the political reality is something else, and we have to deal That's with right. the reality of the political world and not of the moral world. That's right. That's right. Let's use that topic to pivot to the U.S. So, Albert, um, with U.S. elections coming up, let's cover Ukraine first. The U.S. appetite or Americans' appetite for Ukraine. You covered the the guy in Ohio who you know really doesn't care, but generally, what are you seeing kind of on Capitol Hill in terms of the appetite for Ukraine? Well, it's funny because like, you know, you just recently, I think like two days ago, you saw uh, Mitch McConnell come out and say, oh, no more money for uh, Ukraine at the moment, because he sees the reality in the polling numbers right. within the GOP, within independents, and even some Democrats are just like, they're, they're, they're done with the yep. Ukraine story, right? The, pro the problem that we have is again, how do you send a hundred billion dollars to Ukraine when domestic companies are hurting and losing jobs, right? Yep. That, that's, that's, that's the core of the situation. Inflation is going up, jobs are being lost. Forget about the jobs number today because that was 95% of it was government, but I'm talking about mom and pop, you know, yep. brick and mortar stores on main street are losing jobs, they're hurting economically. And that it, comp that transcends over to the Ukraine issue. It's like, I cannot send money here if our home issues are problematic. And yeah. the, for the first time, I've seen not just Mitch McConnell and some establishment Republicans start to uh, deviate away from uh, the Ukraine issue, but even some Democrats have uh, started to allude to, you know, less, you know, less for, uh, global issues and more for at home. And that's that's common. I mean, it's an election coming. Voters in the Midwest vote for senators. They're going to get subsidies. They're going to get ethanol waivers. They're going to get so on and so forth. And anything they could like throw out at, you know, in Congress to uh, up the budget. And Ukraine, unfortunately, is not not going to be with it. And and it's interesting that you say that uh, Zelensky overplayed his hand. <laughs> that was quite clear during the Hamas attack when all of a sudden these glorious stories of of uh, Moscow was the one that initiated it or uh, or uh, the, the October 7th was uh, uh, Putin's birthday and it was a gift from Iran. They're trying to tie in both these things because they see the writing on the wall. Like, you know, the, the money is not unending in the United States. OK. You say money's not in any of the United States. That's a long discussion. But uh, I want to go back to, uh, you said the unemployment numbers that came out today, 95% of the jobs were created by government. That is a problem in the eyes of most Americans, right? Yeah, because they're, they're not real jobs for Main Street. I mean, like I said, most of those jobs are in Virginia or in the uh, outside the military bases, so on and forth, so forth. But in the, in the Rust Belt of America, those, those, aren't, those aren't real jobs. Right. Right. And in, 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 in Kentucky or Alabama or Texas, those are those jobs. They don't transcend, yeah. you know, into, into those places. Yeah. And you know what? Americans are portrayed, portrayed as being stupid. Everyone around the globe likes to, you know, look at, you know, um, whatever Americans ge geography skills or whatever and say, we're, you know, we're stupid people. But Americans aren't stupid. OK, I mean, when you look at things like this, people can see that 95 percent of the jobs are government jobs. They see that, you know, their income isn't keeping up with inflation and so on and so forth. So, you know, you can only fool people so long. So, OK, so you've covered inflation. You've covered Ukraine. What are the other if you had to kind of rank order the issues for American voters, what, what would the top, say, five be for you? It would be certainly inflation, uh, jobs, economic problems, jobs, certainly that. Um, oh, what a crime. Crime is still pretty high in cities like New York and the urban areas. I mean, that's just that's just the that's just uh, that correlates with, you know, inflation and jobs being lost. I mean, of course, crime is going to rise. Immigration has been an incredible problem as they've completely ignored the southern border so i mean those four would be my top top issue right now top issues I would, yeah i would say immigration was probably overplayed as an issue in 2016 it, it mm -hmm. hit some republicans but democrats i don't think really cared but now that you've got guys like the mayor of new york city complaining about immigration it's hitting all across the U.S. and people are realizing all across the U.S. that this is a major issue. Uh, I, again, domestic issues always 
push what global policies and that you're that a nation is going to do now even in chicago uh, it was a spectacular video where the residents of chicago which are notoriously left as left as you can get were screaming at the city council because they were spending 50 million dollars for housing migrants when their own constituents were losing jobs and had parks and recs and social programs cut you know those things those things have consequences in elections Gosh, imagine what it would be like if they were in Texas. We see this stuff all the time, <laughs> all the time, right? So, Virginia, I, I know you're an American. What what are your like? What do you see as the top issues of Americans, and what's your perspective? I think uh, immigration, illegal immigration, is where like the top issue, but not recent top issue. It comes from a long time, and no one has really covered this. And uh, I mean, Donald Trump did but he didn't finish the wall. So that, you know, that was some, I mean, he couldn't, he tried, but um, yeah, inflation. I was in America recently after I think three years and I saw the inflation in $1 doesn't worth nothing. I mean, right. it's, uh, you know, I, it, I was really surprised and I was going from Argentina. We have 200% inflation per year. So it's not that inflation, it's, you know, it surprises me, but I I compare America with America <laughs> and just a yeah. few years ago, and it's something, you see the numbers they are giving you from the government and it doesn't make any sense when you go to the supermarket or you, you go eh, 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 everywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, immigration, inflation, I, I think those are top and also insecurity. And I think foreign policy in some way is something that worries people because they see this thing with China, they see Ukraine, Russia, and they don't know what's going on inside the country. If they have the Chinese people inside their country, their government, what they are doing there. Well, we just found out you had a guy there around in the Department of Defense that was a Cuban spy. He was actually here in Argentina and I don't know which other country. And I think people, I don't know if everyone, but in general, you can find more consent than before, are, are more worries than before in you know, normal people that about, are about foreign policy and what could happen. In, and mm -hmm. I mean, the 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 position America occupies in the world. I think those are like top issues. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the foreign policy issues for Americans. I, I mean, Biden administration has probably been the worst administration yeah. I ever ever even read historically in terms of foreign policy. I mean, there's been so many errors, and Carter, it does. Weigh, Carter it, could make a a strong showing there too. Yeah, he could, except for, you know, at this point in time, we have Hamas issue, Ukraine issue, yeah, <laughs> Venezuela issue, Afghanistan I mean, legacy issues, Afghanistan, yeah. uh, you name it. There's so, and they're yeah. like, and they're losses that will take a generation to rectify and hundreds of and millions I, of dollars, if not trillion dollars to, to fix. And, and I forgot one thing that is the fentanyl crisis. I oh, think that is a huge. big issue and people, yeah, huge. people are very worried about that. Yeah. So I, I watched the Republican debate a couple, you know, a couple of days ago, and I know it's not Trump, and but two of the four, I think at least two of the four people on stage said that they would be in favor of sending U.S. special forces into Mexico to take out cartels. Okay, um, I think three of the four plus Trump. Now I think Trump may have said that too. I'm not exactly sure about sending special forces in. Three of the four people on stage, and I know Trump has said this as well. They would undertake the largest um, uh, export of immigrants in history to send, you know, these people back to their home country. And so, you know, these are not small things that they're proposing. What the Republicans are proposing are dramatic departures from where we are today. Do you think that just those two proposals on their own, do you think that will attract people? Or do you think that just kind of is seen as kind of spooky far right to borrow from the, the BBC's article we saw earlier? Depends on who, depends on where you're asking the voter from. I mean, obviously Texas and Florida and, uh, you know, parts of New York City and the main cities, it's going to resonate, but, you know, out in the suburbs where they don't really see the immigration issue, it's going to detract them. So it's, it's like I've always told people, 
uh, U.S. elections is a numbers game divided up by cities and municipalities, right? So depending on where you, you know, where you ask that question, yeah, could you, you get varying answers. Uh, but seeing what's happened in New York and Chicago and L.A. with the immigration issue, I think it's more leaning towards, you know, people wanting to see something along those lines happen, whether they discuss it publicly or within their friend circle or not is a different story. But okay. I we're going to get really nerdy on some uh, uh, election arithmetic for, for just a second, Albert. We've had some, uh, we had uh, this Republican um, congressman from New York uh, out, ousted from Congress uh, earlier this week. We had Kevin McCarthy say he's out as of the end of December. Mm-hmm. You know, So do you think the Republican majority in the House is... Um, is a thing of the past, especially going into the 24 election. Do you think the Republicans can can maintain and increase their majority in Congress? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think they'll probably end up losing Santos' seat. Uh, they'll retain McCarthy's seat. So I, I don't. I think what will end up happening is a a tighter a tighter majority for the Republicans, which is problematic because it's already it's already at the point where a handful of Congressional members can dictate policy for the entire U.S. House, yep. so it, it's it's tough. Luckily, <laughs> during election time, most uh, most of the time, both parties are on board with subsidizing American voters in any oh. which shape or form. So yep. I don't see any too many problems heading forward in uh, legislation because okay. of it. Okay, great. That's good to know. All right, um, l- l- real quick questions about you, Virginia. Will Joe Biden be the nominee for the Democrats? I don't think so. I you think don't think it's so? Newsom. Wow. No. Okay. I think no. there will be a, like a war there between Newsom and Kamala Harris, but I don't think Biden will be the nominee. Wow. Okay. Albert, what do you think? He'll be the nominee. It's too okay. late for anybody else besides Kamala Harris to uh, jump in and take that 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 torch going forward. I mean, you have to build out... I mean, we're already in December. Uh, primary elections are Super Tuesday in March. So unless something happens in the next month, it's right. it's it's already too late to begin with. But I mean, some, something would definitely have to happen in the next 30 days. Okay. Okay, great. And then Republican nominee, is it Trump? Uh, it's, too, it's too early to say. I mean, that's on a state-by-state basis. Uh, DeSantis will certainly win Florida, California, New York, and these other states. Iowa, perhaps New Hampshire, and then it's an electoral, it's a, it's a super delegate race from state to state. And most of the polling, the, most of the polling says national Republican primary. There's no such thing as a national right. Republican primary. Most of the states are open primaries that don't even show registration. So how do you poll those people? You don't. Right. So right. I, I would, I want, if I was, if I was betting on it, I would say 60, 40 Trump at the moment. Right. But things can change drastically. A couple elections early on favor DeSantis and then who knows what will happen. Great. Virginia, what do you what do you think? Trump or no Trump? Well, as Albert said, yeah, I think it's too early to say he's now he if, if it's today. Yes, of course, he will. But he has these, you know, judicial issues and i see there are a lot of people pushing for other candidates so let's wait yeah it might be i think a lot of possibilities there but not 100 percent sure okay. and that's the thing and that's the thing tony is it's not a trump versus single candidates right it's it's either trump or no trump is what the primary is right. at the moment right. so as exactly. people as people drop out like Vivek and Nikki Haley and so on and so forth, those delegates will go to another person. And if they're already not voting for Trump, the most more likely is they'll be allocated towards a DeSantis or a secondary candidate okay. at that point. Okay, interesting. All right, great. Thank you for that. Let's move on to Latin America. Um, you know, there's there's a real battle of ideas underway in Latin America and Virginia. We all know that Javier Malay was elected in Argentina. It's really been hard to avoid that coverage. Um, I kind of just want to jump right into it. Malay's election was dramatic, but I'm curious if he will actually have the ability to do anything. Um, With the U.S., we saw kind of the inertia of the bureaucratic state that it proved to be a real impediment for Trump. 
do you think Malay can, can really get anything done? Well, there is one thing that the world is expecting from him because what the world is watching is his statements on free markets and corruption and socialism and everyone is going crazy and saying, oh, look at this. Uh, he's a true libertarian. Well, he is. He is, and I trust he is. But the thing is, we have a context in Argentina that I told you at the beginning, we have 40% poverty, but of the 40%, 60% of children in Argentina eat once a day. And 60 of very, children in Argentina. 60%, 60 percent of children in Argentina receive only one meal per day and a very poor meal. So the levels of poverty in Argentina has never been seen before. And you have that in a structural level. So he's uh, taking power on Sunday and he has a very complex situation to solve 200% inflation. This guy that was uh, his opponent, a candidate that he was the economy minister here, he spent a lot of money that he took from the treasury to make his campaign, to give away money to get votes. So we have a huge problem in one week, something that cost, I mean, you went to the supermarket and this costed 1,000, today's three or 4,000. So it's exploding and Millet is not even the president. So he, the, the, the important thing about Millet is if he can and if he will go in the direction he said he was going to be, I mean, in the he will look to make Argentina a free country or more a freer country because we really are very close here. You cannot even, I mean, if you want to buy something from Amazon, you cannot because it will be stopped, whatever you buy. I mean, it's the smallest thing to the biggest thing. So inflation, no money, poverty, and a lot of Crime, insecurity. I would imagine. I mean, it's 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 something really, really crazy what's going on. So he has to first take care of the economy. And he has a lot of support around the world. That's great. And so if he can do everything the world is expecting him to do, well, what is the world expecting? I don't know if the world is really noticing what the situation is in Argentina. Here in Argentina, people are expecting that he cut taxes, he low inflation, and that people can go to the supermarket and buy food. That's what we are expecting here. That's it. I mean, if he can do that, then he will be successful already. And then we have another situation after he solved the economy. We have a lot of opportunities because a closed country, imagine if you solve the inflation here, then you have a lot of opportunities. You open the markets and Argentina is a good place to compete and to make business because people here are well educated yet. And so he can be a good president. He can take Argentina out of this complete mess. It's going to be difficult, but not because of his ideas. It's because of everything that surrounds the, the, him, the unions. You know, the unions haven't made any noise in four years with this record inflation and poverty. And today they are announcing that Millet becomes president on Sunday and they are starting to make noise on the riots on Monday. And they are very hard, you know? So that's gonna be difficult for him. If he can do it, he has a lot of support, almost 60%. So of population that, you know, that is very important and transcendent. So I think he can, hmm. but the Virginia, expectations, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me, let me ask you, uh, what's the, on the, since you're there, uh, what's the perception on the ground about dollar, dollarizing the Argentinian con economy? Well, I think people, some people are agree, other are not really sure. But in general, where you will see in the middlemen around, they see, okay, I prefer to get my money in dollars instead of this peso because this 100 peso, 1,000 peso I take, it, you know, 
is is one value today and another value tomorrow. So uh, people in general go and say, okay, do whatever you want. That that's what is going on in Argentina now. You have these discussions of economists and specialists on television, social media, newspapers, but then on the ground, people are saying, solve it, do whatever you need to do, but solve it because the situation is dangerous. So yeah, he has the support of a lot of people, so he better do it quick and right. And uh, the most important thing here is he makes it on Monday, he gives a lot of you know new uh, news about what he's going to do and make it quick because otherwise he's going to fail. But yeah, I mean, he has the support of people because people is sick and tired of what's going on in Argentina. Um, I think, yeah, in general, they, if they know what dollarization is there or not, they say, okay, go and do it and solve it. Yeah, I just hope and pray that he doesn't consult people like Jeff Sachs on how to fix it. <laughs> He'd mm -hmm. make it dramatically worse. Um, well, that's the problem. That's the problem, Tony. It's like who's going to be in his cabinet? What kind of if, what kind of advisors is he going to have? What kind of policies are they going to push? Well, he's only realistically he's one guy. He can't fix that's the exactly whole thing. Right. He needs a he needs a, a cabinet and he needs a network to support him. Unfortunately, I have a pessimistic view of that because. I mean, the left has been ingrained in Argentinian politics and Latin American politics for so long. It's just, and it's easy for them. Yeah, and it's easy for them to undermine things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's 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 choosing people that are not really coming from this libertarian side. So he's choosing like technic technical people from each, you know, or monetary things. Um he's choosing that is specific kind of people that have experience. Some people are not really liked in general because they were already part of other government that failed, but because they were so slow making the the policies and applying the policies they had to, to do. But he's making, I mean, he's choosing people to solve, first of all, you see that he has the, that focus on the economy. So as I'm, as I'm telling you, uh, Albert and Tony and Ralph, I mean, he has to cut inflation, stop it. If he does that, then everything else will be easier. You know, we are not talking here about environmental policies. We're not talking here even about immigration. We don't have that problem in Argentina. And people are emigrating. So uh, the problem is inflation. So Millet, yeah, it's a surprise because in this situation, we had two outsiders. One was Millet, and the other one, it was a, a guy that he, he didn't even make it on the primaries, but he's mm. quite loud. And he's a communist. And he said to solve poverty, we have to take the land of the rich people. And a lot of people follow him. So we were in danger of becoming that, of becoming Venezuela. Zimbabwe. And Argentinians, yes. And Argentinians, even in the poorest place, Hello. Oh, yeah. In in the poorest place, they chose a guy that said, I'm a libertarian. You know, I want to cut taxes. I want to open the markets. The populist, Peronist, leftist, fascist, because the Peronism is all that, they couldn't handle that speech. They couldn't win for the first time in front of a guy who was saying in television, I will do free markets. I'm pro Western. I'm pro. I mean, so he has a lot of a lot of support. So if he does the right thing and the people that is with him just work on solving the economic problems, then we have a lot. I mean, Argentina well, could do very well. The fastest way that they can do that would be to either peg the peso to the dollar or dollarize yeah. at least on the ground because I mean Venezuela actually did that. So Venezuela, yeah. you know, under the under the covers dollarized and it stopped hyperinflation dead yeah. in its tracks. So I mean he does have a point here with the dollarizing the economy there. Great. Yeah. And Good first step. we have an experience on that. Yeah. Good first step. So um I want to ask you about uh Malay's first foreign trip as president elect was to the US. He was to New York 
And uh, I've got on uh, on the screen a, a pretty scary picture of Malay with Bill Clinton. Um, yeah. So how do you think the U.S.-Argentina relationship uh, will evolve? Well, that was a surprise to me since I follow Malay and I, I, I met here, I met him a couple of times like a decade ago. So I know how he thinks. Um, but I'm not sure. I, he's, you will understand this, he's a libertarian. And a libertarian always or mostly they are focused on economy. Okay. So everything has an economic point of view. But then when the, in general, when you take these people out of those economic places, they don't really know all about it. So I think he made a mistake by getting to meet Bill Clinton, the guy he is selecting to represent Argentina in the embassy in Washington. He was always a founder of the Clinton Foundation of Hillary Clinton campaign. So that guy is going to Washington representing Argentina. So I don't think that is good news because uh, everyone who know uh, Bill Clinton, Clinton Foundation, the Global Initiative, you know, Bill Clinton don't sit by your side to have lunch with you just to know what you're thinking. They're pursuing business in compromise. So I think that was not necessary uh he of course and there's one thing here he went to the white house he was with sullivan okay that's okay because he's he's the elected president but he never met one congressman or senator of the republican side and i mean marco rubio ted cruz they are very connected with latin american latin american issues and issues that are, are affecting argentina directly so that was a surprise to me i can give him the doubt, no, he hasn't. That's a signal. And I don't think that's a good signal for the future of Argentina and even for the future of our relationship with the with America and with the right side of freedom. So, but I will expect him to become president and to see what his foreign policy is. I mean, I think he's a, an honest guy, Malay that he's a good person and he believes in freedom, really believes in freedom. From the time I started to listening to his ideas and, and following him, it's been a long, I, I mean, a lot of years and he never changed his position. So, mm. I mean, I trust him, but I expect him to be, you know, on the good track on everything. It's important, the economy, but it's important not to fall in desperation because Argentina needs money and then associate Argentina with, you know, the Clintons because yeah. that could be dangerous in the future for us. Yeah, I can see both sides of that. I think on some level, being a libertarian, he's also a pragmatist. And he may have seen that this was a lunch he had to take and these are some relationships he has to build to build relationships within the US political establishment. So I, I can see the worries uh, mm -hmm. you know, from a purist perspective, but I can also see the pragmatism uh, in the meeting. So, I, you know, I'm not really sure yet. Albert, you had something to say? No, that's 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 right. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is the Clintons and the left in the United States and Wall Street are the ones that dominate the money. And that's it's an unfortunate reality that uh, no matter what world leader comes to the United States, that you're going to have to meet those type of people. Um, I do agree with Virginia that is, you know, he should have met with Marco Rubio or Cruz or Rick Scott or Mitch McConnell, somebody, you know, on the right, at least uh, at least to start building, you know, uh, building a network within D.C. on both sides of the aisle. So I do agree with her. on that. Great. OK. Yes. And just, just to, to finish. Yes. I mean, Maria Salazar is coming to Buenos Aires representing the the Republican Party, but I know he can. He has to be pragmatic, and he has he has to meet everyone that can help him. But I hope he doesn't compromise more than he should. That that's it. Uh, of course, right. he cannot just go and have a meeting with Donald Trump and Marco Rubio and leave everyone behind because that's not politics and that's not good. Um, but I hope he manages 
and people who will manage foreign policy will do it in the right way. I mean, taking, you know, in, I mean, considering Argentinian context, that is very complicated. Mm. So let's wait. Right. I, I hope he does, he does right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be great to see Argentina put on the right track. That I think yeah, I don't think anybody would be, would be against that. Okay, guys, this has been a long episode, but let's let's cover one final uh, topic uh, in Latin America. We're, we want to talk about uh, Venezuela and Guyana. Um, uh, what's happening there? I think Albert, can you give us a quick overview of what's happening there, why it's happening, and is it important? Uh, what's happening? You know, Maduro and his <laughs> glorious ideas to annex parts of Guyana and take over the oil exploration contracts out in the, I think most of it's offshore, to be honest with you. You know, I, I don't know how he thinks he's going to do that. I personally think it was more in lines of like trying to shore up support for his upcoming elections, but realistically, they, they don't have the military. They were, the Venezuelan army was eating zoo animals because they were underfed last year. All right. So let's, 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 Everyone take a break. There's, you know, there's not going to be some glorious Venezuelan uh, invasion of Guyana. Could there be a little bit of a uh, tensions and skirmish on the border? Yeah, maybe, you know, but there's no roads going into Guyana. <laughs> I mean, it's dense forest. So it's not like the Venezuelan military is funded or even modernized to conduct such operations. Could it be know? a way for, uh, for Venezuela to get military aid from China or Russia. Uh, I mean, it's just kind of the roll up to this as a way for them to say, hey, here's some money. I mean, they, they money. could, but I mean, it would be suicidal because it would give all the United States all the justification it wants to, you know, up the tension against Venezuela. And if Venezuela yeah. wants to sit there and try its luck, God bless you. Goes Godspeed to all you guys. I hope you do it. In fact, I hope you try it. You know, because I've been calling for Venezuela to be overthrown for years since Trump. So yeah. I hope I hope he tries something. Virginia, what's your what's your view on that? Well, I think these tensions you can see in Venezuela now. Um, you can see that happened in different ways in Chile when Piñera was there on October 18th, when the, all these leftists burned the whole city of Santiago. Now you see Venezuela trying to make war with Guyana to annex these different tensions we have here are more than, you know, are like something they are preparing to get the region in a very big tension all around. Let's not forget we have Brazil with, that is just next to Venezuela. Brazil is a very complicated country. It's a great country, but it's very complicated in, they have a lot of, they have some kind of guerrillas there. We have guerrillas in Latin America and these, Sao Paulo Forum that they formed between Fidel Castro and Lula, it was meant to get all the guerrillas to the, together to restart the 70s and retake the power in Latin America. And they did. They retook power, but, and now they have this connection with Russia, China, and Iran. Let's not forget here in Argentina, we had uh, terrorist attacks from Iran. We had these planes that were coming last year from Iran. No one saw it coming. The government was involved here and no one knew what these planes were, you know, having, where, where, what do you have inside? I mean, they were coming from Venezuela, guns, weapons, whatever, we don't know. So I think in general, if you look like the big picture, they try they are trying to make different, you know, tensions around the continent. And that could be something because of China is behind this and Russia, because China wants to have, you know, the Middle East, Latin America, Europe, all the continents, you know, with tension and American taking care of everything so they can go to Taiwan. That's what I think. And I'm, I mean, Latin, Latin America is a place that could be in a complicated situation in the near future, not right now. And I think Venezuela is giving the first signals. Not that they can win and take Guyana, but I'm, I'm not sure this is good news or I, I wouldn't want like a military um, intrusion there because I think it, it could go bigger 
um, could be a, a disaster. Mm, interesting. Guys, thank you so much for this. Um, and we've gone so long that my light's gone out. <laughs> so um, <laughs> thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for all the thought you've put into this. Um, have a great weekend. Really appreciate this and have a great week ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Tony.